love using that phrase after preaching on Adam and Eve last week, my suitable helpmate. Um, <laughs> all week, yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, I guess we're, yeah, I guess we're ready. Yeah, okay. All right. Father, we do thank you for what you're doing in this hour. Yes, we thank Lord. you for these wonderful testimony, Lord, about Israel. And yeah. Lord, we thank you that our times are truly in your hands and how you give us these little rays of hope when you reveal these things to us. And Lord, we just come before you and we cry out, Father, as this word comes forth, that you would really give us all a spirit of wisdom. I know I pray this every week, but I pray that you will give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation yes, in the knowledge yes, of yes. Jesus, that you would unveil him to us in the depth of the word, Lord, that you would really begin to cause the light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ to shine into our hearts and that we would see things and hear things that we haven't heard before. Lord, we pray the thing the thing that I've been hearing this week about this message is that you want us to pay attention to what we have heard. Yes, Lord amen, God, you're amen. giving us the, the treasures of darkness, the hidden wealth of many generations, Lord, and you've opened them up to us. And I, I keep hearing that your heart says pay attention to what you are hearing. And God, that we would be attentive to the word, not just to hear it, but to become it, to do it, Lord God, to really take it and apply it to our life and we ask that you move and that you take Ken completely out of the way and that you would rise up within him that double portion of the Elijah anointing and we ask that you speak through him not by power nor by might but by your spirit in Jesus name and Lord we pray that you will put in him what you want us to hear and we just thank you for that in Jesus name yes amen 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 thank you amen Well, I want to just say a word before um, we get into the actual teaching. Um, I, I really feel the, the weight of the Lord. Um, I have all morning and uh, just on this message, I, I just really sense that this message, uh, you know, I, who knows how it'll come out, whether it'll be good or not good. But I really sense this message is really, really important to the Lord. Uh, and that we heed what he wants to say to us through this. Um, it, it, I've been just carrying it really for the latter part of the week. Uh, you, you know, I don't, I don't, those are, several of you were here Wednesday night when we had our uh, normal Wednesday night prayer time. And uh, at the end, uh, Patricia uh, was sharing some things that were on her heart. And, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting that. Uh, Shelley was singing uh, this morning about being undone. And I think that would probably characterize what Patricia was feeling Wednesday. The Lord had been really confronting her. I, I don't know that it was so much about her per se. It was about her. She said that. and uh, But it was also about the church, I think the global church she was talking about, not just this fellowship. But it certainly was not excluding this fellowship. Uh, and she was just feeling like she really couldn't communicate what she was feeling, but there was huge burden that was on her heart for the church. And it was related to what Brian was talking about just a minute ago about being made ready. The burden that's up from the Lord for the church to be made ready in this hour. Um, and I don't know if what she said transferred to me, uh, but certainly by this morning, I'm feeling that same weight uh, of the urgency of the hour and the seriousness of, uh, of us being made ready as a bride. And so this message will go into that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I uh, was really when I, I, I'm teaching, we, I'm part of our forerunner school, I've been teaching this a class called The Theology of the Bride, and it's like, I don't know, we're about 20 sessions right now. I don't know how many we got. But uh, there was a few that I was going to do actually to an empty room, and Brian wanted a couple weeks off from preaching. And so I said, well, I'm going to do them anyway. I'll just do these two messages. Uh, and 
I was actually going to do the message I did last week and this one together and the, uh, as one just to kind of toss out some thoughts that people could do some study on. But as I began to uh, work on what I wanted to say, the Lord just expanded it. And this one specifically, uh, I've been teaching this one I remember the first time I taught it was probably in India in the late 1990s. And so I've been teaching it for, you know, 20 years or more. Uh, and the Lord just really expanded what he wanted me to say through it. So, and I'm all, the reason I'm saying this, the reason I'm saying this is I really believe this, the truths in this message are really important to the Lord. Really, really important to the Lord. And because of that, obviously, they need to be important to us. So I want you to, to heed these words. Uh, and I'm going to try not to present it with a heaviness, because even though I'm maybe feeling a little bit of the burden of the Lord, I want to present it in a way that won't communicate necessarily the heaviness of a feeling. But I want us to heed it. I want us to receive what the Lord is saying and respond to it. Not just say an amen at the end of the message, but respond to it with our heart and with our actions over the rest of our life, really. Uh, so uh, anyway, with that heavy introduction, uh, I want to talk now about uh, Genesis uh, chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. We want to talk uh, about another one of the types and shadows. You know, if you were here last week, you realized that what we're doing is we're uh, in this class right now. I'm going through several of the Old Testament types and shadows of Christ and his bride. Uh, and so uh, th last week's message uh, and this week's message, which is part two of session 11, is the bride in the book of Genesis, the bride in the book of Genesis. And last week I talked about Adam and Eve. This week I'm going to talk about uh, Genesis chapter 24, where Abraham sent his servant uh, into Babylon uh, to, get, to, to get a wife for Isaac. Uh, and, of course, what we're talking about there is that, uh, that, that Abraham is a type of the Heavenly Father, uh, Isaac is a type of Christ, uh, and the servant that he sent is a type of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then Rebecca, who became uh, the bride for Isaac, is a type of the individual believer who says yes uh, and, becomes, uh, and becomes the wife uh, of Isaac, which is a type of the, the believer taking that journey uh, from Babylon uh, into Zion to become the prepared wife uh, for Christ. So there's really some, uh, it's a really, really powerful uh, story, uh, and there are a lot of principles in it. I've got actually, I uh, had 17, but uh, the Lord had one more out of, uh, well, during the worship. So I've got 18 points, uh, and I know everybody's excited. 18 points, my goodness. <laughs> This is going to take forever. <laughs> and here's what, here, this, I heard this years ago, this statement. I like it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily apply to me, but I said, a message does not have to be everlasting in order to be eternal. It doesn't have to take forever to make it uh, eternal with eternal impact. Uh, but this one may be everlasting. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Now, I, 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 hopefully it won't be. Uh, but anyway, I, was, I want to read one scripture just showing you that the, the New Testament uh, supports um, uh, Abraham and Isaac being types and shadows of Christ. Now, they're, they're, they're also, and I'm not going to go into them, but they're, they'll be in the notes. Uh, there's several points. If you look at Genesis chapter 22 where Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice, and then they provided, the Lord provided the ram at the last moment. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism parallel there between Abraham offering Isaac and Christ going to the cross. So there's a lot uh, of parallel there, and that'll be put in the notes, but I won't take the time 
uh, to show that. But there, there do, there's, a, there's plenty of evidence in the scripture that this is a type of Abraham and Isaac being a type of the Heavenly Father and Christ. But if you look at Hebrews 11, uh, 17, starting with 17, it reads this way. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. Uh, it was he to whom he said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. Uh, he considered that God's a God is able to raise people even from the dead, uh, from which he also received him back. And here's, here's the, the key for us, as a type. He received him back as a type uh, of Christ. And so uh, I think the New Testament supports uh, clearly that Abraham is a type and shadow of the Heavenly Father, uh, and Isaac is the type of Christ. And in our story, uh, the servant that he sent uh, is a type of the Holy Spirit. Rebecca is a type of the believer who becomes the, the, the bride uh, for Christ. Uh, and so you, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to try not to read a lot of scriptures, uh, but just read some as just we go along. But you know, I think you know the story. Genesis 24, Abraham was getting older uh, and uh, he, uh, he needed for his purpose, for his purpose and his promise, he needed Isaac. He'd already had a son, but he needed Isaac to have a bride. Uh, and so the, the fulfillment of the promise. And so he sent his servant into the land uh, where he was from. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Uh, and he went and sent him back to his family, which is, you know, his brother lived up in there and all the, the family was still there in Haran. Uh, he, went, he sent his servant and his servant went there with a very express purpose of... Uh, getting a bride for Isaac and bringing that bride uh, back uh, to the land, uh, to the promised land where Abraham was in Canaan at that point in time, bringing him back there uh, that he might have uh, a wife. And so there's a lot of detail around that. The, the chapter is about 60, more than 60 verses, so it's a fairly long chapter and we don't try to uh, to, to go there in terms of reading the, uh, a lot of it or the whole thing. But that's the, that's the story. So we want to begin uh, to do some, share some principles. I do want to make one more point um, about this. Uh, and uh, Quentin, if you can put that map up on the uh, screen. I want to, I want to show this. Um, because, you know, the first time I taught this in India, uh, and and I didn't know that what I'm going to share here at that point in time. But when I shared that in India, I was talking about uh, coming out of Babylon uh, in order to, to be the bride. And I was there at, with uh, James and Sarah Ripabarapu. And anyway, James's brother, I was saying, come out of Babylon, come out of Babylon. And so James's brother said, well, he really wasn't in Babylon. Uh, and so uh, I thought, okay, well, let me... Uh, let me look do some research. And so I did some research. And here, here's, I want to make sure we're, we're, we're technically correct here. Uh, but if you, if you look at, uh, you know, Genesis 11 and, and 12, you know, Abraham was started out, he was born in Ur of the Chaldeans, which is this black box down at the bottom down here. Now, that is in Babylon. If you look, it's in the Babylonia, Babylonia, that region uh, called Babylon. And so his family, in, in response or in light of the call to go to Canaan, left Ur of the Chaldeans, and they went up north uh, up to Haran, or well, Nahor, N-A-H-O-R, which is right there at the town of Haran. So, and you look at the map and you see it right there with a the little blue box. They went up that way. That Haran is technically not in that region called Babylonia, but it's in Mesopotamia. I, I know you probably don't want a history lesson here, but it, I think it, it will be important, I think, in a moment, too, as an application we'll make. Uh, but the family was still Babylonian. I mean, they were born in Babylon. They still, they still had the culture of Mesopotamia. That area was still a, uh, uh, you know, still Babylonian in terms of its worship practices and all the different 
thing. So the principle is definitely still the same. Uh, and so then they came down from Iran, well, Rebecca and, uh, came down uh, to the promised land from Iran. They had to go north and then back down because they couldn't cross that desert uh, directly. So uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'll draw some points from that a, a, in a, a little bit later. But I wanted to make that, that clear uh, that, we're, that we're right uh, in terms of the geography of the area in case we run into anybody like uh, James's brother who wanted to bring that up. Uh, okay, so let's talk, let's talk about Genesis chapter 24 uh, and hopefully you will be able to uh, you know, read that whole chapter. Uh, let, let's make, let me make, I wanna make, I wanna start out by making a number of points from God's perspective. And I'll read the, some scriptures as we go along uh, about this from God's perspective. Uh, the first one uh, is that this chapter uh, pictures the Jewish wedding system uh, and also the marriage of Christ to his bride. Uh, it was really interesting. If you get, you know, we, session two of this uh, class, and we've taught it a number of times here. Uh, talks about the Jewish wedding system uh, and that the, they were a, a young Jewish man and woman were betrothed. Uh, then they, there was a year period or there was a period of time in between and then there was a consummation uh, marriage where they were, would live together as husband and wife. Uh, and so there are a number of points there, but one of the, the point I want to bring out here uh, is that the the marriage between a young Jewish man and a, and a Jewish woman, the betrothal uh, normally took place uh, at the home of the bride. That, that's where the betrothal ceremony took place. The consummation ceremony normally took place at the home of the groom. Uh, and so, and there was a period of time in between. Uh, and so it's interesting that the servant had to go from the home of the groom to the home of the bride uh, in, in the Babylon area, area of Babylon of Haran and, all, and Nahor. And then she had to say yes, and then they came to the, uh, to the home of the groom. Isaac had been in the wilderness, and when she came back, he comes in, to where she was coming and they see each other and they consummate the marriage. And they say that's a, a beautiful picture. Um, and you'll get more if you read it yourself. But that, that's a beautiful picture of Christ and his bride. You know, the, the scriptures say that when Jesus comes back, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of discussion exactly the journey he takes before he enters Jerusalem but he certainly comes in from Jordan, <clears throat> from the wilderness. It's a picture of, as Isaac is a picture of Christ when he sees his bride. Uh, I don't know about you, but I get excited about that thing. But anyway, the, the, the first point there is that this is a, a shadow of the marriage between Christ and his bride. That's the first point. The second point is that God's eternal purpose demand. this is a really important point, God's eternal purpose demands a prepared bride for Christ. It demands it. So that puts a, I mean, to me, when I, when I really sense that, that puts a weight upon me that I need to make myself ready is that. But it demands it. I mean, we know from other teachings that part of God's eternal plan was for Christ to have a bride. But if you, if you look at God's call to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, it said, if you'll leave your land and, you know, go to where I'll give you, I'll give you your land, I'll give you a land, I'll give you descendants, and you'll be the father of many nations, you'll be all those things. Abraham, for that to be fulfilled, 
Abraham had to have a son. Without a son, it, he would never have had the, the multitude of the nations that would have come from him. He had to have a son. And the son had to have a bride. Otherwise, it would have never happened. So for Abraham's promise to be fulfilled, it, it demanded that Isaac have a bride who would come into the land with him. Now, as we look at that as a type and shadow, the eternal plan and purpose of God demands that Christ have a bride made ready. When you think about other teachings and other things, the, the bride and Christ, Christ and his bride will be partners forever and ever and ever. The plan of God will not be fulfilled unless and until Christ has a bride. And so it demands Christ to have a bride who will come out of Babylon and come into Zion. Which, you know, Babylon is a picture of compromise and, uh, you know, it says in Revelation, a cup full of abominations and compromise and independence from, uh, from God and uh, all sorts of sin uh, all sorts of issues in their life. So the bride has to come out of all that and it demands that they have a bride. The eternal plan of God demands that they have a bride. That's the second point. So only have 15 or 16 more to go. Okay, the Holy Spirit, number the third. The Holy Spirit is completely focused on the task of getting a bride for Christ. The Holy Spirit is completely focused uh, on getting a bride for Christ. And now the Holy Spirit is God, and so he has a lot of things going on. But his, I believe the primary task of the Holy Spirit in this hour is to, is to re, get a bride and prepare a bride for Christ. Look at Genesis 24, verse 9. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master. That goes in back into the covenant, uh, which I won't go into right now, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand, and he rose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. <clears throat> then in verse 33 of Genesis 24, but when they, they invited him in into the, the Rebecca's home, but when food was set, <coughs> excuse me, when food was set before him to eat, he said, "I will not eat until I've told my business." So here's the point. The point is that the servant, who's a picture of the Holy Spirit, wants the Father sent him into that Babylon to get the wife. He was focused on that task. I mean, that was, you know, he was not going to be sidetracked. He was not going to be delayed. You can see it all in a number of scriptures there. He was focused on that task. And I think this is really important that we see this. The Holy Spirit, that's a, a major may be the most important agenda. I believe it might be the most, I do believe it is the most important agenda in this hour of the Holy Spirit is to get a bride for the son and prepare that bride to be made ready for him. And so, you know, it puts it in our responsibility. If that's what the Holy Spirit is doing, we need to cooperate with that, don't we? Amen? Amen. Okay, that's... Uh, Point three, the point four, the Holy Spirit is searching, is searching the earth for a willing vessel. That's what he's doing right now. The Holy Spirit is searching throughout the earth for a willing vessel. I mean, we see that as he sent him into Babylon. 
But you know, I mean, we know it from our own uh, experiences that, <clears throat> can you, Donna, can you hand me that water bottle right there? You know, just with our work in Africa, you know, we're, we're thanks. We are, we're focused on raising up messengers who will prepare a bride uh, for Christ in Africa. He wants a bride in every nation. You know, and we're working with the Forerunner School where, where those are mostly not so much pastors in that, but mostly but believers all around the world, really. With Canada, as Brian mentioned, Spain, uh, just different places around, around the earth. And it's all about preparing a bride. Uh, so uh, the Holy Spirit is searching the earth for that willing vessel, willing vessel being uh, the key. Uh, point number five, the, the Holy Spirit is going to the church to find a bride for Christ. It's really important that we understand that. The Holy Spirit is going to the church. You know, if you look at, if you look at um, Genesis 24, the servant went to the family of Abraham. Nahor was Abraham's brother. Uh, Rebecca uh, was Nahor's granddaughter, if I've got my genealogy correct. So he went to his, he went to his relatives to get the bride. He said, don't, you know, in the, in the passage there, it says, do not take a bride for my son from the daughters of Canaan. You go to my family. He sent him specifically to the family. Of course, we know that Christ is the firstborn among many brethren in the family of God. And so he sent, he's sending, uh, he sent the servant to the family and it's a picture of where Christ wants to send the servant, the Holy Spirit, to get his bride to the church. You know, if you look, if you look at what the servant did when he got up to the town of Nahor, he went first and he, he met the young ladies who were drawing water at the well. Rebecca was one. And he had put out a fleece and Rebecca uh, met the criteria of the fleece and she first invited him to her home. And that, I mean, she, you know, gave water to the camels and, and did other things, but then she invited him to stay at her home, which is a picture really of inviting the Holy Spirit into the heart, into the heart, salvation. But then there was a separate decision once she got in the home once he got in the home, the separate decision was he asked her, would she be willing to leave her home and to go to be a wife for Isaac? And so we see two, two separate things. First, the servant came into the house. Secondly, he invited her to become the bride. And that's the way it, that's the way it is. I mean, it can... It can happen quickly. It can happen at the same time. But they're two different things. Betrothal starts when we're born again, yes. But when I was saved, the last thing on my mind, I didn't even know about it, but the last thing on my mind was becoming a bride for Christ. I just didn't want to go to hell. That was my motivation for coming to Christ. But then later on, later on, I realized there is a bride. I realized that the bride has to make herself ready and that I have to respond to that. And this passage show, shows that really, really, really clearly. Two different issues there, even though they can happen at the same time. And then the next point is very similar to that. The bride will be selected from within the body of Christ. Verse 37, which uh, I kind of touched on. My master made me swear saying, uh, you shall not take a wife from my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house 
and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. So that's that principle of coming from the church. Uh, Number seven, Christ will not go to Babylon to take a wife. This is really, really important because the church pastors all over the world are taking Christ to Babylon. Verse 7 of 24. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying, To your descendants uh, I, will give, uh, I, will, I will give the land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from these, from there. But if the woman is not willing uh, to follow you, then you will be free from this oath. And here's the phrase I want you to hear. Only do not take my son back there. Do not take my son back there. We have to come out of Babylon to be the bride made ready. And, and you, you know, you see it with all the seeker-sensitive things that are going on in the church and all the compromise that is being uh, spoken of by pastors uh, really all over the world in order to get people to come in or to have a big church so they can be famous and all that, all the compromise that's being allowed in the church is all over the place, widespread everywhere, all over the place. And what they're doing, they're taking Christ into Babylon and saying all you have to do uh, is, is I'm going to bring Christ to you. It's okay to compromise. It's okay to do all this stuff. You can live just any way you want to. But the bride, and this, this is a word uh, for pastors that, might, that may listen to this. The bride will never be made ready if pastors take, take Christ into Babylon. And allow compromise. And that's, you know, so it, it's sometimes hard messages are not, we get upset with them or we don't like them or we won't, you know, just teach me some good words, speak some good words. And we do need a, a balance of that. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, the hard word is good for us. Because what does it do? It shatters that Babylonian mentality that's in every one of us. Just like Abraham, we were, every one of us was born in the Ur of the Chaldeans. We were born in Babylon. And we've got to come out. But we need, we can't take Christ there. We need Christ to speak, to speak truth and honesty and, and all of those things so that we can, it can confront our flesh and we can deal with it and we can come out. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Uh, let's see. Okay. Got a few more. This is still from God's perspective. The Holy Spirit will provide to the one who says yes everything they need to be made ready. That, that's, that's really important. Uh, verse 10. Then the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with, on a variety, with a variety of good things of his masters in hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. You know, 10, you know, some people have said, you know, he rode one camel, he took nine with him with things, which could be the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> and that could be true. But 10 is a number of totality as well. 10 commandments, uh, 10 virgins, you know, 10, uh, 10 days of testing. You know, 10 is kind of like that number of fulfillment, of completeness. And so the Holy Spirit, when he calls you to be the bride, he takes everything you need. I mean, in, on this 10, uh, these 10 camels were provision. There were clothing garments there were all sorts of, you know, cosmetics and beauty, things to beautify. So he, he brings with him everything 
he, they, she needed. And he does the same for us. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes the more, you know, if you don't really meditate on becoming the bride made ready, you better not even thought of this. But if you have, you, you know, you're faced regularly with, man, I'll never be made ready. I see my flesh. I see my sin. I see my weaknesses. How in the world will I ever reflect the fullness of Christ in me? Am I the only one that thinks that? I mean, maybe we all, I think hopefully, not hopefully, but maybe we all think that or have thought that. But the Holy Spirit brings with him everything we need to make us ready. What we have to do is cooperate with him. That's what Rebecca had to do. She had to say yes, but she had to say more than just say yes. She had to actually get on one of those camels and head back in, but she had to live her life that way. Uh, but the Holy Spirit will give us everything that we need to make us ready. This is number nine. There will be also be angelic help for the bride to make herself ready. Uh, verse 7, he will send his angel before you and take a wife for my son from there. Uh, you know, there's other uh, places in, the, in that chapter where he talks about angels. Not only is the Holy Spirit there, he's given us angelic support there to make us ready. There's, there is a... There are angels to help, but there's also watcher angels. Uh, you know, the verse 21, the man was gazing at her in silence. There's a, there's a watcher angel. And in fact, when we remember when we signed the book back, I don't know, several years ago, uh, one of our seers in the fellowship was saying that... Uh, was saying that there was a watcher angel watching us that, that, that was to sign uh, the book. And I believe that, that that's happening. There are watcher angels as well as helper angels uh, that are there. But angels are there uh, to help us to be made ready. Um, number 10, there is urgency for the bride to be made ready. I really, really, really sense this right now. But in verse 56, the servant said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. You know, the, 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 the friends, the relatives of Rebecca wanted uh, the servant to stay maybe 10 days or so uh, before they left. And he said, no, there's a, you know, don't delay me. Don't delay me. And there's an urgency. And, it, and there's an urgency now. I feel that urgency uh, more and more and more with the, the, the condition of world events and all the things that are happening. I feel that urgency now that is t we can't delay any longer. If we've been, you know, if you've been on the fence and not really actively uh, b pursuing this broader relationship, now is the time. The Holy Spirit is saying there's an urgency in the air. There's an urgency in the spirit realm. Let's make ourselves ready and let's do it now. Amen? Amen. Okay, verse, that's point number 10. Uh, verse, point 11, the heavenly father will have a worthy wife for Christ. The heavenly father will have a worthy bride, a worthy wife for Christ. Verse 40, <clears throat> the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you to make your journey successful. And you will take a wife for my son from the relatives of my father's house. Christ will, ha will, will have a bride who's made ready. Absolutely, we'll have a bride who's made ready. The question is, whether as an individual believer, that individual believer will be a part of that bridal company. But he will have a bride made ready. And I know I want to be a part of that, and I know you do uh, as well. 
So those are the 11 points from God's perspective. Now, let's talk about from the believer's perspective. The bride must come out of Babylon to become, uh, to be, the bride must come out of Babylon to become the wife of Christ. When I, so I'm just going to find this easily. Yeah. When I read this verse, it, it, it really hit me. And I, and I want to, I want to read it, and hopefully it'll hit you as well because it's good. It's a good hit. Genesis 11, verse 31. Terah, who was Abraham's father, took Abraham his son and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son's Abram's wife, and they went out together from the Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. This is chapter 11. And here, here's the phrase. And they went as far as Haran, and they settled there. They settled there. Remember I showed you the map. They started Ur, and they went up to Haran. And then Abraham came on down to Canaan. It was quite a journey. But there, a lot of the family who was called to go with him settled in Haran that was still part of Babylon. They maybe come out of, they've come out of Ur of the Chaldeans. They've come part, part of the way, but they settled. God doesn't want us to settle. They have to, we have to come. We have to come all the way. We can't, I mean, some, if you look at the global body of Christ, some haven't even begun the journey. But a lot of the body of Christ has, has begun the journey, but they settled in Haran, halfway there. And we're going to be, God's going to be dealing with all of us until either he returns or we die, one or the other, whichever comes first. I mean, this is not going to, we're not going to get to the point where we are made ready until we meet him. And so there's a lifelong journey, and we can't settle. You know, sometimes people think, okay, it's just too hard. I've gone this far, and it's getting harder. The road's getting narrower. Whatever it may be, I can't go any further. And they settle. Or, I, well, I've come a long way. I mean, I, Donna would say, I, I think I've come a long way from where I was <laughs> I mean, it's only a miracle that we're still married, you know. We've been 54 years now about, but, uh, you know, and it was mainly me. Uh, and so I've come a long way, but I, I know that I've still got a long, long way to go. I can't settle. I can't settle. And you can't either. You can't settle. Uh, we have to come out of Babylon to become the wife of Christ. The second point from the believer's perspective, believers must with intention, with intention, agree to pursue becoming the bride for Christ. And I talked about two different decisions a minute ago. Rebecca invited the servant into her home, but she also agreed, uh, agreed to come and be the bride. With intention, we have to agree to become the bride. Look at uh, 2457. And they said, we will call the girl and consult her wishes. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Thus they sent away their sister Rebecca and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. Uh, and so she she invited him into the home, but then they, there was a specific question related to her being the bride. Will you go with this man? Will you go with this servant of, of Abraham, of the father? And she said, I will go. And so there is, you know, there is that. I mean, I remember in the uh, early days of the church back in the 90s, 
we would say, yes, yes, I'll ride with you. Yes, I will go. Say yes. I mean, there was a, I think it was Daryl Evans had a song, uh, Yes, Lord, Yes, Lord, Yes, Yes, Lord. I forgot the name of the song now. And we would sing that and we would say yes. Um, and so there is a yes and it has to be in our heart. Yes, I'll ride. I will, yes, I'll be, I'll pursue this journey of being made ready. Yes, I will do it. I will. Yes, I will do it. So there is an intentionality there. This is where I think a lot of people miss it. They, they know they're betrothed as a bride. They know the bride needs to be, be made ready, but there's not much intentionality in terms of, I want to get on the journey. Just kind of focusing on the general relationship with Christ rather than with intention, <coughs> make me ready as a bride. And I think this is really, uh, the, the Lord's really hitting on this right now. We have to have intentionality. It's really important. I mean, I, I know I, and I, mean, I know I'm been writing on it and all that, so it's before me more than it maybe is you. But every one, every relatively regularly, it's, Lord, I want to be made ready as your bride. Make me ready. Whatever is needed in my life, uh, whatever I'm blind to, whatever those things are. <laughs> Deal with me in whatever way you want. I ask, be, be, be gentle, please, Lord. But make me ready. Make me ready. Um, intentionality, that's really important. The third principle from the standpoint of the believer is that if a believer rejects or ignores the bridal invitation, the Holy Spirit will move on to others. Verse 49, if you are going to deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. In other words, if you're going to say yes, tell me. Let, let Rebecca come. If not, let me know that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. In other words, let me know if you're going to say yes. And if you're not, I'll move on to somebody else. So, you know, he's going to have a bride. He's going to have a bride made ready. The question is for us, are we going to ignore it? Are we going to reject that bridal invitation? If so, the Holy Spirit will move on to somebody else. He wants, the, the Lord wants a full complement of his bride, bride made ready. But we have to uh, not just ignore that. You know, there must be intentionality to it. Um, okay, then the fourth one. Others cannot make the decision for us. Others cannot make that decision for us. We're not the bride made ready because we go to a church that focuses on the bride being made ready. Amen. We can't be the bride made ready because our spouse is on that journey. We can't be made ready because our parents are on that journey. Amen. Amen. We, can't, we can't be that. We have to make our own decision. Verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel replied, The matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you bad or good. So they were, they were all for Rebecca going with the servant. Uh, they probably saw those 10 camels and they got some stuff too, you know. And it's like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll send her off, you know. Somebody else has to go get water at the well, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll take some of that gold, yeah. Uh, and so, but in 51, here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. So they were for it. But then in 57, and they said, we will call the girl and consult her wishes. Her family was in agreement that she should go, but she had to agree herself. We'll consult with her. And so nobody else can make that decision for us. We have to be the one uh, to do it, to make the decision and live it out. Okay, fifth one. The believer who agrees to the bridal journey must actually live out their decision until she meets Christ or he meets Christ. 
you know, it's not just a yes and then ignore it. We have to live it out. 60, verse 61. Then Rebecca arose with her maids and they mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servants took Rebecca and departed. Uh, so there's, a, there's an action that has to be put into our walk with the Lord. It's not just saying, yes, make me ready. There's a, there is a, an actuality or an acting out or, in, uh, or cooperation, an ongoing cooperation with the leadership of the Holy Spirit uh, to be uh, made ready. We can't settle along the way. Uh, you know, we just can't say yes in a worship service. Uh, you know, it was a long journey. It was a long way from Haran, Nahor, down to Beersheba where they met uh, Isaac. The sixth point from the believer's standpoint, uh, believers must avoid settling along the way but must continue, continue until the end. And I've talked a lot about that, so I really won't, be, I won't say any more about it uh, other than it's a lifelong journey. It is a lifelong journey of allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our life so that Christ can be formed in us. Uh, you know, we don't need to be uh, navel, navel gazing. Uh, you know, at times the Lord says look inwardly, but he, look, the Holy Spirit is pretty good at bringing up things, you know, that we need to deal with. And maybe it's one at a time or two or three at a time. He doesn't overwhelm us. And just because, you know, he's not showing us something right at the moment doesn't mean there's not something else he wants to deal with. Maybe he's giving us, giving us a few minutes to breathe a little bit. Then he comes up with maybe something else. Uh, and so, you, you know, it's a long journey, but we have to not only say yes, but we have to cooperate uh, throughout uh, the journey. Uh, and so number seven, this is the last uh, point. Uh, believers must not listen to those who say a radical pursuit of the bridal journey is not necessary. It's really important. Verse 54. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, let the girl stay with us a few days, say 10. Afterwards, she may go. And so they were suggesting a delay. But you know, he was saying it's, he was saying it was urgent. I got I've got to go. And so they were, you know, they were saying it's not as important as the servant was saying. It's very important. It's urgent. Um, and so, you know, we can't we can't listen to those who say radical pursuit of the journey is not necessary. And there's a whole major part of the church. See, a lot of the evangelical church says. When you're born again, you are the betrothed bride of Christ, which we believe. But they say, but, but therefore, you are there ready. You are already ready. That's all you need. I mean, most of the evangelical church uh, would make that point. You will be part of the eternal bride just because you're born again. We can't listen to that. It's tempting. It's, it's tempting. Well, I don't have to allow the, the Holy Spirit to do all this stuff in me. It's real tempting just to say, okay, I'll be evangelical. Yeah. But just because just they believe it doesn't mean it's right. You know, Christ is not going to be, uh, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and get that evaluation, it's not going to be, uh, you know, because we, well, the church I went to said we didn't have to worry about that. Um, So we, need, we can't listen to other people. We have to say yes. We, we have to pursue it with all of our heart. And so that's all my points. Well, I got through 17, 18 points in one hour. <laughs> pretty good, They're pretty good. Really important, though, that we respond to it. I want to. I want to lead us in a response, but I want to. I want to uh, lead us 
in declaring this. I'll just read it, and then we can say yes to it. This uh, passage from Genesis 24, verse 60. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, and I'll put in brackets, the bride, become thousands of ten thousands. Hmm. Amen. And may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them or the gates of their enemies. Lord, let that be the case. Let the bride become thousands of ten thousands throughout the earth. That's our prayer. And may that bride possess the gates of our enemies. There's a battle now, but it's certainly intensifying and on the horizon. And we want the bride to possess the gates of the enemy. To be made ready. And throughout eternity, throughout eternity, be the eternal partner of Christ. Throughout the millennial reign, to partner with him, like Brian's been talking about, like those priests of, uh, of sons of Zadok who minister before the Lord and then are sent out in partnership or on assignment from Christ to, to confront, you know, conform the earth into the kingdom of Christ the kingdom of God. And then throughout eternity, throughout eternity, throughout the, all the eternal ages to be the partner of Christ. Let that be throughout all the, and your descendants possess the gates of the enemy. Let it, let it run throughout eternity. Oh, let it be, let it be, let it be. Amen, amen. Amen. All right, well, let's, let's pray. Let's stand up and let's just pray. And let's just ask the Lord to, wherever we are on this bridal journey, help us to heed, heed the call. Lord, I thank you that you have sent your servant, the Holy Spirit, to me and to our church to invite us into the bridal paradigm. We thank you that you've opened it up at least to, in a measure to us. We're so thankful for that. And Lord, I can't say yes for anyone else, but I say yes for me and I and. I ask that we would all say yes to, jo to joining in that bridal journey of readiness. Lord, I pray that we would not settle, that even though it has and may in the days ahead even get harder, Father, for I do sense a baptism of fire is coming upon the earth and probably coming upon this nation as well. And it may be more difficult to continue on that journey, but I, say that I pray that we would not settle. We would not settle. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. We want to be made ready. I pray, Father, that wherever we might be in our journey, that we would that we would jump back in or jump on or at a faster pace or whatever you're saying to us individually, that we would be made ready. Help us, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. I think, I mean, I think, uh,